All right, we're live. Welcome to Red Hoop Talk. I'm Roy, and this is my sister, Shannon. How are hey, you doing? Roy. I'm good. You're flashing out again, man. I know. I think it's going to stop. It it kind of like, it's an intermittent weird thing. I don't know why it does it. I, I switched to two computers, and it still does it. I think it might be my electrical or something's mad at me or it's something. Your, it's your energy, man. You're just okay. like screwing with the, the computer. Um, put, or maybe you're being bugged or something. Thank put you. It, Thank put you. it up for the, for the, for the computer. Let's, let's put a little clean, a little more over here. I don't know what's going on. So anyway, we'll keep, we'll keep trying. And if it gets too crazy, I'll, I'll turn off my, my camera for a minute. Maybe that'll, how's that? You want to talk to me like this? No, I don't want to talk I to you like that. I had to do that last robot. week. Um, <laughs> beep, All right. Pop, boop, boop, beep. <laughs> Well, I've got, you've got that, but I've got this little, I've got my little like spirit hanging up over here. I, I, some, I don't know quite what that is up there, but um, it's going to. Some, some bugs happening. Kind right? of weird light happening. But so, so it's a, what, what why am I blurring out? So we've got, we got a great, we got if a you, great show today. Um, why don't we uh, get started and, and, and recognize. Yes. Um, give some land recognition. I'm standing in Maryland, uh, the the place of the Piscataway people. Uh, where are you at, Roy? I am in Southern California. I would like to recognize the Lucinos and the Chumash people upon whose land we stand. Aho! Thank you. Oh, we've got some. We got some folks <laughs> that are Sandra and Victoria are here saying hello. I think my my son is giving you a compliment there that for some reason you look better now. He was saying you looked a little orange last week. Oh, well, like I said, I've been getting, I've been getting a little tan. Maybe um, I was using that same stuff that our president uses to get uh, tan or something. That's, <laughs> you're, you're spraying, you're spraying uh, down, Roy. It's called, it's called Cheeto tan. <laughs> All those Cheetos. <laughs> Looking like. A flaming hot Cheeto. Oh. <laughs> well, um, we're having an it's been a, a damn interesting week and it's it's yeah. not stopping. Um no. uh how's how's your week been just just personally? Well, personally it's been a crazy, crazy week because um last week on on uh you know after last Friday's show I had a uh, a friend of mine that I grew up with uh, from the third grade, you know, we've known each other all our lives. I, I, I had to bury him on Sunday. Well, mm -hmm. we finally got to have a funeral for him. And uh, um, my, my mother came out to visit. And so I was all stressed out about that. And, and then my, my, my friend's funeral and then my car broke down on my way to the funeral. So I was on the freeway and all these things were happening to me, you know, this week. And, and so when I get to my, back to my car. So somebody from the funeral came and picked me up off the freeway and took me to the funeral. And that was all a big emotional thing, you know? And then mm -hmm. I got back to my car to get my car back home and it took the tow truck five hours to pick me up and take me home. Oh. So I was a, I was a wreck. And then I get up in the morning and, and uh, my mother decides to have a big fight with me about, you know, the, the, uh, you know, because I'm mixed blood. My mother's uh, had a big fight with me about, you know, my faith and where I should be walking and the road that I shouldn't be walking on, the what road that I am walking on, that whole thing. So I got to, I had this big personal long week, you know? And, yeah, uh, you did. and so, so that all went down. And then, and then I saw that this whole Rushmore thing was going down. And uh, that's why I got the flag back here today because, uh, you know, you know, being a gore dancer and, and, and being, you know, in the military and being a warrior, um, you know, I put, I've put it in perspective what this means to me. You know, it means, it means this place here and it means all indigenous people's land to me. That's what the flag represents to me is this place. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it doesn't necessarily represent the government that's in power right now or that has been in power for all these years. But to me, Personally, it represents this place, and the reason I went out there and stood on the line was to protect this place and uh, all Indigenous peoples' rights and and uh, the um, the possibility that um, the government that was put in place that actually was based upon 
you know, native people's beliefs and political systems at the time when it was put together, you know, a lot of influence, a lot of native influence went into the building of our governmental structure, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I, I've always had hope that one day that structure, um, would represent us as people for, for real. And, uh, as long as we continue to fight and as long as we can continue to believe in it, and as long as we continue to have some type of influence, like we did when it was built, um, that, that we won't go away and that, that their possibilities are there for, for us too, you know? And right now I'm seeing that more so than ever. And, uh, like I told you, my own family, half of my family is, uh, um, <laughs> they're, they're, um, they're on the other side of that fence. It's, it's unfortunate. It's, it's caused a lot of, uh, a lot of heartache for a lot of, a lot of people in my family. Um, so, so they're the, the, to be honest and what's, you know, about being in my position, you know, being half, you know, half breed, um, you get to see everybody's ugliness for some reason. You get to see, you know, non-native people be ugly to native people and you get to see native people be ugly to white people because, you know, you fit in the group or you're white enough to be around, you know, white guys that talk in the locker room about other people and things. So you see a lot of stuff and you sit in the middle of a lot of conversations and a lot of things, you know, and, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm watching them right now while all of this is going on with, you know, the BLM stuff and, and now natives are starting to stand up and, uh, starting to take stage and some of their issues are starting to take say stage. You know, we can talk about that a little later, but you know, the, the, uh, the Washington football team is, uh, is actually in the news right now. The, the mainstream news, you know, it's been in our news all the time. You know, we talk about that, you know, ridiculous thing all the time, but now they're starting to talk about the, uh, their, their sponsors are like, Hey, it's not, it's not popular to do that anymore. And now we're, we're asking you to change. And I think we're in a very unique position right now. And, but what I was getting to um, with my family and, and the inside scoop and, and seeing they're scared. They're really, really scared. They're scared that um, they're losing their power grip. They're scared that democracy might take over and kick them out. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's not a frightening thing or a bad thing. It's a really, really good thing. And they should be scared. And I'm glad they're scared. And But I'm seeing it. And I'm sure that this is going to... Um, how can I say it? I'm sure this is going to be um, in their death throes. There's going to probably be some, some things that they're going to do to try and stop it. Um, but I am seeing them flailing their, 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 their way of life is, is, is going away. It's disappearing. It's, it's no longer just their power that they get to hold on to. I think that things are starting to shift. It's what it feels like anyway. And with this thing going on this weekend, you know, I see Native people having, um, you know, a voice again. I think they're going to be able to stand up and, and maybe take advantage of this situation. And, uh, you know, I mean, some people don't even realize what that place represents. You know, like I had to educate some people about it. I think we've talked about it here before, but, mm -hmm. you know, you and I were both adopted you know, painted into a Lakota family. And uh, that's their sacred grounds there that those faces were blasted into. Their six grandfathers were blasted off of that mountain. Their sacred grandfathers were blasted off of that mountain. And those faces of col col colonists were put up there in their place. And to imagine that happening anywhere else on the planet, you know, today, or that represent that representation being allowed today is is unfathomable. I mean, think about it. Like if we went to Mount Sinai and freaking blew Trump's face in it, you know, or something like that. I mean, it would the world would go nuts, you know. And uh, that's what's that's what's going on here. And and people don't understand that this is a sacred place that has been desecrated. And on top of it, it represents, you know, nobody. It's it's in stone, and it's, 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 this is where, how it's going to be. You know, it's almost like, it's almost like them saying you're done. This is, a, this is who it is now. And we're going to make it this way, you know, and you'll accept it because it's in stone. 
But that's not necessarily the case. You know, that's not necessarily the case because we can still look at that mountain the way it is. Am I killing your time or something? <laughs> so, so just like this flag, I'm taking it back, even though it may represent something else. To me, it represents, you know, something different. Just like to the Lakota people, those right. hills represent something different, even with those faces blasted into it. It still is their place. It still is their holy lands. It still is theirs in their hearts and in their minds. They know that that place belongs to them and it, it, it just can't be taken over anymore. And um, we're taking these things back and um, tearing things down. And, and I like to, I like what I'm seeing that's going on out there. I really do. And um, I think we're in a unique place right now. So it's going to be a good conversation today. That's for sure. Yeah. Do you want to, um, um, I'm going to let you do that. Well, well, hold on a minute. So, so, you know, I, I was watching a little bit. So right now streaming is Trump's big firework extravaganza at, uh, the six grandfathers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, part of the opening, ceremonies to open it off this afternoon. I think it's been going since four o'clock mountain time um, and goes until 10 o'clock mountain time. Um, and you can watch it streaming. If, if you get bored with us, you can turn over and, and to the North Dakota or South Dakota's website and, and see it streaming live over there. Um, but there were some uh, 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 Lakota gentlemen um, singing and doing songs and telling the story about um, Hasapa. So um, uh, it, it, it really just, I was happy to see that they were there and that they were educating the public that, that were standing in the audience, um, you know, with their Trump make America great again hats on. Uh, you know, I was happy to see that, but I also know that outside of that, um, that, that big amphitheater that they're in outside there's native people protesting uh, and, and others that we hope are going to be safe tonight um, that they are going to be uh, physically safe from, from police and other interference as well as um, safe from COVID and hope that they're wearing masks and taking care of themselves in other ways. So I'm, I'm really worried about what's, what's going to happen tonight and what tomorrow is going to look like for all of us because I, I am not as hopeful as you are, Roy. I'm a lot more pessimistic because I think the only thing that really changes, um, at least in the society that Manifest Destiny has created here, is is based on capital. It's it's there's no real change unless there's a fina financial incentive to do so. I mean, the reason why the Washington football team name is changing, even though activists have been trying to get it changed since the 60s, at least. Um, and it we've uh, tribes and organizations have had ongoing um, campaigns against that name in the last decade and litigation. Um, it's only when FedEx and Nike and Doritos and whomever says, we're going to take away our sponsorship from you, Dan Snyder, um, that um, they're deciding to make a different. <sighs> you don't, you don't think that's when Crater wanted it to happen and how he wanted it to happen? Him, well, I, I the creator, wanted it to happen. <laughs> I guess that's how the creator knows to uh, how, how to tickle us. Right. I guess uh, that's how he knows how to move us is that, that many of us, are um, still tied into greed and um, and that. So, okay. Well, it's in it's in the right time when it when it's time it's time and uh, it might help to to it might just be one of the dominoes, um, you know that that flips that clicks the other domino that clicks the other domino that makes everything kind of start to fall into place. You know, that's how these things happen. And, you know, black swan events and things like this happen for whatever reasons, you know, and, uh, and, um, you know, then, then that's when change happens. And when, when there's vulnerabilities, you know, right now, 
um, there's a vulnerability in the powers that be. There's a big vulnerability. And mm -hmm. um, it's because the people have time and energy on their hands um, to go out and, and make force and, and to show, you know, hey, this is not okay anymore. And things are starting to change. And, and that's, that's a good thing. And like I said, I don't think the fight's over. I don't think that the war's even begun yet. I don't think that um, the battle is, is won or any of that. So I'm with you on that. It's, there's concern. But you got to give fuel to what's happening now. And you've got to look at it in a positive light and encourage what the people are doing now. So all those people out there at the six grandfathers at the Pasapas out there, go, 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 go. Do your thing. <laughs> Stand up. Be loud. So, you know, don't don't let them uh, take that place over and make a mockery of it. You know, don't let them use that day tomorrow um, which is a which is a phony, funny thing. They call it Independence Day. Well, we have never been independent. Um, there are people here on this land that have never been independent. So that whole thing is 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 false, and and it needs to be exposed as such. And what a more perfect place to do that than where they're at right now. Right. And and uh, it looks like they've walked into their own trap. You know, like they've really there. I, it's it's almost like a setup. I worry about what's going on because it's almost like it's almost too perfect. Right. It's like right now during this vulnerability, that's what you're going to do. You're going to really put yourself in that position there at that place. You know mm -hmm. where when where you know the, the that that place is very powerful for Indian people. You know, I mean, those people that are there that are defending it, that are standing up for it, that place is going to give them a lot of strength and a lot of power. So mm -hmm. why would you want to go up against that? It's, it's, um, I don't, I don't know. It looks like, uh, it looks like kind of cause suicide or political suicide to me for them to be down there messing around with that at this time, you know, in this place. So, yeah. And, and there's some really great, um, articles and op-eds that have been written this last week about, about, um, the six grandfathers and, in our, uh, you'll see on our Facebook, uh, Association on American Indian Affairs, Facebook, and other social media. Uh, we posted a lot of those articles. There's some really good ones. Um, so read about it. There's some great stories in history. If, if you don't know a whole lot about what happened uh, with the Black Hills and the, and the fact that even the federal government and the U.S. Supreme Court said that those that land was taken wrongfully mm -hmm. to this very day um the the sioux nations have not accepted a dime for the black hills they want right. the black hills back it's an extremely powerful story and and um and this is why we're resilient this is why we're still here because we're still here to protect places like that yep i'm going to um I'm going to give it one try. I'm going to try and pop on, pop right. off and pop back on to see if this whole flashy thing goes away. Um, I really got to work on it. And then I'll let you start to bring the guest up so that you're not sitting here by yourself. So go ahead and give it a shot. Sit here by myself. Do a little karaoke. What song do y'all want to no, hear? No, 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 no. No, no Indian karaoke. Come on. Yeah. Um, well, Don't do that. No. I'm going to say hi to, to. We finally got over a hundred subscribers. Oh, we don't, yeah. we don't want to lose any. 130 or something like that 120 some uh i want to say hi to everybody who, who's joined say, us so far. say hello to the chat room and and look that's we got good. lance in there lance is in there crack, cracking them again that's what i'm doing roy oh, go away yeah. sandra's in there all right, all right we need to make some admins too i'm not sandra's gonna be an admin i'm gonna make her an admin so that she can help us in our chats yeah and sandra's if she doesn't mind and Sandra's been giving us some uh, guest ideas. And so I really appreciate everyone's help and support. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I've seen a, a few of y'all here uh, back for another time. And some of you who've been with us from the beginning, thank you so much. I want to let everyone know. Wait, where's the camera? I want to let everyone know that we are going to be changing time slots. So our live show uh, starting on July 19th will actually be on Sunday at 4 p.m. Pacific and 7 p.m. Eastern. So our last Friday show will be next Friday, July 10th. 
Um, and then we're going to shift to Sunday. So that way, if, if Roy gets a job, <laughs> um, he can work late on Fridays. Um, so I hope everyone will still join us on Sunday. And as always, we're, we're on demand streaming on YouTube and, and Facebook. So, so welcome everyone. And um, with that, I, I see Roy's going to pop himself up here. And we're going to introduce our guest. I hope everybody's ready. Um, great guy that we're bringing on today. His name's Sheldon Spotted Elk. He is Northern Cheyenne and has been working with Indian children and families for quite some time. He's also an attorney and has been, uh, he's appointed as a judge at the Ute Indian uh, Tribal Court of Appeals. Um, and he graduated from the University of New Mexico and uh, is, I think, currently in, in the Denver area in Colorado somewhere. Um, we're going to see him from his kitchen today. <laughs> and, and let me bring up um, uh, our Northern Cheyenne friend, uh, Sheldon Spotted Elk. Hello, Sheldon. Hey, how's it going? It's good. Hey, hey, what's up, Sheldon? Hey, it's good to, good to be on the show. Thanks for having me on. Real good to have you. Real good to have you. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. I think I saw some kind of Cheyenne um, in our chat room there. Where is that? Oh, I see. Uh, uh, Zadie. 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 Roy, Roy's flag is the old Cheyenne flag that was captured from Custer is what he said. I, that's a good comment right there from Lance. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, um, so Sheldon, so are you in Colorado right now? Yeah, so I'm Denver proper, Park Hill neighborhood. If you're in Denver, if anybody's here, um, so it's oh, the don't home. give your address or anything. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the home of Chauncey Billups. Actually, this is where he grew up. So I live in his na old neighborhood. So um, it's a good neighborhood. Um, it's it's a historical red line district, actually. So there's a lot of relevant and pertinent uh, issues even today. So I, I, I this is a, a neighborhood that's been affected by historical racism. So. Right intentional racism. So um, that's where I live here in Denver proper. So it's good, beautiful country. Uh, it's a beautiful day today. It's a little bit windy, but uh, it's my ancestral homes as well. It's coming from Cheyenne territory, Cheyenne and Arapaho territories right here in, in Denver, Colorado. So. <laughs> Absolutely. And and that's where we were, we were going to have our um, sixth annual repatriation conference uh, in late October. We're still working on that. It, it may be a virtual platform, uh, maybe small groups were still working to figure that out, but um, was sure hoping to get out there in, in October, but uh, not sure that that's going to happen. Uh, real beautiful area. And of course, um, uh, uh, there's some great people and, and uh, great community there. I really, I really enjoy go getting out there. So, so uh, have you always been in Colorado or, or where are you from? Um, so my family originally from my dad's uh, lame deer, born and raised, um, lame deer, Montana. Um, but I was born in Oklahoma actually. And so, um, and then grew up most of my life in Navajo country, Navajo and Ute country in the four corners area, um, in a small town. It's a, uh, it's a very racist town actually. It's a very, uh, there's a lot of racism that I grew up, but I was, I was aware and conscious of racism at, I don't know, six years old, um, mm -hmm. because of that. But I, I think there's a whole dynamic of growing up away from, like I grew up in Indian country, but I grew up away from my tribe. So I was like a minority. Um, and I think the version that I received of, of Cheyenne identity through my dad, um, I got the best of it actually. So I was, I grew up loving being Cheyenne, loving Indian people, loving Indian humor, loving the way we talk, the way we walk, the way that we do everything, you know, love our art, love everything. So I grew up just, right in the heart of, of all that. Um, and just growing up with a really positive outlook on what it means to be a native person, but also very specifically a Northern Cheyenne person, you know, like I, I think maybe all of our tribes, we grew up really centric, ethnocentric. Mm -hmm. uh, and so of course I felt like, like we were God's people, actually Mahio, you know, we were, we were God's people. He shined upon us and we were the Hebrews of the plains, if you will, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I heard all those stories. I was really fortunate in that way, too, is that I heard all our Cheyenne stories. You know, our, our Cheyenne exodus, our Cheyenne genesis actually begins uh, there in the Black Hills as well. So uh, Nora Wuss is our sacred mountain. Uh, Bear Butte, 
right next to Sturgis. So right. we have historical relevance to that area right now too. And um, definitely people go back there all the time. My great grandfather, the one that had, gave us the last name Spotted Elk. Um, so of course, when we went to the reservation in 1884, uh, there's a prohibition about against leaving the reservation. Um, and we would always make annual pilgrimages back to Bear Butte, back to Nora Wuss. And so that ended. Um, and when we finally were able to go back, and this is 25, 30 years later, uh, Charles Spotted Elk, um, he was one of those, Hoish was his Indian name. He was one of those guys that got to go back to Bear Butte. You know, he was an elder at that time. And he went up there and he fasted on the top of the mountain is what the story that we, we heard. And I got to hear all these stories from my dinner table for my dad. You know, like I was really fortunate in that sense. And um, like I said, always received such a positive identity uh, affirmation of what it means to be Cheyenne and all these cool stories that I went to bed with or ate dinner with. Um, I, I was really privileged in that sense. Wow. That, that's awesome. Um, so what, you know, you talked about even uh, as a kid seeing racism because of the, the areas you lived in, what, what did that look like? Um, it, very specifically, I got, so I grew up around uh, Utes and Navajos and there was a, I didn't know it at the time, but there definitely was a pipeline, school to pipeline prison that was being created at that time. And so all my friends that I grew up with, especially in elementary school, uh, me included, I, I was either in-house suspended or suspended from school every year from third grade to eighth grade, actually. And so um, including one year in seventh grade, my mom actually saw it. I'm, I'm half as well. So my white grandma, I, gr I grew up in these really bifurcated worlds, by the way, too. So my white side, they're Mormon. So you got to add that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> uh, and, and, and this town that I grew up in, it's predominantly Mormon. And of course, Mormon is and the, one of the central tenets of it is that Indian people are fallen people. Yeah. Uh, and, and that Mormonism has to raise them up. And so it's the, very, lost, the lost tribe, right? The last tribe yeah. of the lost the tribe. The Nephites and the yeah. Lamanites and the yeah, Lamanites are the good ones, I think, right? And they like um, uh, the Nephites were bad, so God turned yeah. them brown. And I'm sorry, there's some fucked up shit out there. It is, <laughs> fucked up, <laughs> it is some fucked up shit, and <laughs> and just in that town, like it's so the whole premise. And I, I've never read I've never read Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, but the most racist book I've ever read is the Book of Mormon, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's it's the diction definitionary a different definition of white supremacy and so um so on top of that is there's kind of this weird libertarian political atmosphere there the sagebrush rebellion um and so you could kind of see that manifest even today with with the bundies that took over that national <laughs> and so definitely i grew up around all this uh, <laughs> weird white supremacy and and of course bear butte is you know bear's ears is right uh where i grew up as well um oh, wow. so like, anytime indians organized in that community um it was definitely fought against um but there has been recent lawsuits in that area that have been big winners for actually native people so um, some say that the brown v board of education case for indian country mm -hmm. Actually, he's out of San Juan County. Uh, started off as a Cinegini case and ended up as the Myers the uh, school board case. Um, and of course, that was settled because of just this historical racism of, of on reservation Indians versus off reservation Indians. Um, Utah is also the state was the last state that recognized if you're on reservation to vote in state or local elections. Utah was the last state to allow that to happen. So. Um, oh. There's a special yeah. kind of racism that happens in Utah. <laughs> yeah, I, I lived in Salt Lake City for a few years after high school. And, you know, right in the middle of Salt Lake City is a, a huge statue of statue of Brigham Young, right? Yeah. And his, his back is to the Mormon church and his hand is to Zion Bank. So he stands there, you know, looking uh, with his hand towards the bank. Uh, and, and what's so ter what's so terrible, what I found during my time there, um, is first that I was, um, <laughs> this is one of those stories. Um, I was, um, uh, what do they say when they come and teach you the Mormons, the, the missionaries come and teach you. Um, so I, when I, when I first moved to, to Salt Lake city, I was heavily involved in theater. And so this, this couple took a liking to me 
and uh, said, you know, come to our house for dinner and meet our family. And I did. And they brought two missionaries with them. One was a Native American from Oklahoma, which is wh where I was from. And the other one was from Ireland, who grew up next to my favorite band, which was U2. So they had like this weird, it was like they were bringing me into their, um, this weirdness. They're, and they, they're and good, they they're good at it. With them. <laughs> <laughs> and and they sung like I I had grown up any Christian church I ever went to it was like Baptist or Southern Baptist, um, and so it was really lively. And I went into this Mormon church and they were singing. It was like being in some kind of weird zombie apocalyptic you know kind of space. But the worst of all of that, and I've got tons of Mormon stories, but, but, but the worst of all of that is that I saw that my friends who had children in school were being constantly discriminated against, constantly bullied, because the Mormon kids knew who wasn't Mormon, because I guess they had some kind of special uh, service that they'd go to every morning or something. Um, and I couldn't believe um, how deep it ran with the children. Um, uh, and if you were an outsider, man, you were an outsider. So that must have been what it was kind of like for you um, growing up and always getting, um, uh, you know, getting in trouble in school. I bet the Mormon kids weren't getting in trouble. They have pagan radar. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, and actually that, that term code switch, though, and I think I, I grew up in being a code switcher. So knowing the codes of, and it's based on language originally, but like you could switch from speaking Spanish or to another language and you, right. you know the codes and you know the, the, the jargon and, and the, the, whatever needs to be said for that place. Um, I grew up knowing just at a very young age, the rules of two different environments because right. I grew up half in in a town that was about half too you know like the community is about half native half anglo um and getting in fights and and just doing all those different things that little kids are doing like i was, I was going to say i got sent away to go live with my white grandma went to this junior high and so i went from exclusively having native friends um to this junior high where there was only two indians in school um there was me and and the mat mascot the roy junior high all <laughs> world <laughs> I stole that from Sherman Alexi, by the way. It's in one of his books. But I, I went to the school where was, oh, there's no natives in the school. And it was just really tough for me to adjust and acclimate to that environment. They actually did change the mascot. And I remember being part of that. Like, I got to write a little, like, what does this mean to you when I was a seventh grader, you know? And and it didn't. And just like the mascot, it, yeah, I felt objectified by it, actually. And I felt made fun of. Um, and I have this, la my last name spotted up different from anywhere, anybody in that community. Right. Um, they made this phone book too. And like I volunteered at first, like, yeah, I'll be in the phone book. And I'd get prank phone calls like once a week of just people saying, Hey, is your last name Spotted Oak? And everybody just laughing in the background, you know, and that was all new to me actually. So there was a whole different, another level of, uh, and I got suspended from those schools too. And, uh, got in some legal trouble up there too. So, uh, um, had some, I wasn't a bad kid, and like I look at all my other friends that I grew up with. Those kids were talented individuals. They were artists. They were they were geniuses. Actually, they were top of their grade in math and reading. And um, but just because of discrimination, some of them went on to jail. Some went on to prison. Some went actually one of my my good friends actually. And I think this is part of the reason I do this work that I'm doing now is when I was in law school, my second year in law school, um, he passed on. You know, so he. And I was asked to go up there and give his eulogy. So I drove back up to this town that I'm from. It's about five hours from Albuquerque um, and drove through all those communities. There's eight reservations. I, ca I counted them on that truck, on that drive. I counted all those eight reservations that you drive through uh, from Albuquerque to Blandon, Utah. Mm -hmm. um, and really had an impact on me about one, adverse childhood experiences. Because uh, my friend, he, he was exposed to a lot of things. You know, we all were actually growing up in those communities. Um, especially racism and I, that's not counted on the adverse childhood experiences but and that's a real damaging one actually um and, and of course the aggregate of high, the higher your a score the higher your adverse childhood experiences are uh the sooner you're going to die it has detrimental health effects on you you can look at indian country and this has some relevance to indian country as um as some of the health things that we we deal with with diabetes and and heart disease and and just some of those things with alcoholism drug abuse 
Um, those are all trauma responses, of course. And so um, it really had impact on me at the time, admit, right in the middle of my law school career and uh, trying to figure out what I want to do with a, a law degree and what did I wanted to do. And it just really had like a significant impact and really steered me to do juvenile delinquency. I re got to represent juvenile delinquents uh, <laughs> myself. I'm a juvenile delinquent. <laughs> so I just got to like the, the kids that were doing the same thing as me when I was growing up, I got to do that a little bit. Then I uh, got to represent children in foster care as well. And a little bit of parents uh, that had their kids in uh, custody as well. So that's kind of what I did with my law degree after that. But that just really had a, even to this day, I'll, I'll tell you, even to this day, it still has a significant impact. Mm -hmm. That community has a significant impact on on the work that I do. Wow. Uh, yeah, it, it sounds like a, a direct path that you took, like you are where you are supposed to be. Um, and, and you're still doing good things. Hey, Roy, you got to speak up here if you've got questions for Sheldon, because I'm just going to like, I've got all these questions I want to ask him. I'm, I'm listening right now. I'm listening. So go ahead. I'm, I'm just, you know, kind of relating to working with the juvenile delinquents because me too, I, I, I do that with Shannon every day. You know, I got to deal with this juvenile delinquent here. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Provide her some guidance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just keep her straight and narrow. <laughs> okay, Roy. Well, he's been a real <laughs> asshole to me today. So so I think he's trying to he's trying to joke it up. He's he's oh, I love you, Roy. Um, <laughs> um I need some of that orange tan spray. So if you could tell me what brand that is you're using, uh, I'll send you some. Try to you know, get some color in these, 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 uh, you know, you can go and get it out there. This is Southern California, you know, Hey, I mean, it sucks being out East. It's just, I, I don't get any sun. You know, I grew up, my grandmother always like sending me outside. You're too white. Get some sun. Um, get some color in your cheeks. Um, but anyway, you know, it's helped me pass when I needed to pass, um, uh, it, to help, advocate where we need to advocate. And I'm sure you've, you've found yourself in similar situations, Sheldon, you went to, you went to law school, UNM, which is a really great law school, really great people there. Um, what did you do? Um, were you doing anything before law school or, or? Yeah. So I got to play, I played college basketball for two years uh, oh, hell. up in Wyoming. So I got to do that. And oh, you're only I, like five, eight or something, aren't you? <laughs> Oh man, I'm six one. Dang, I'm six you're talking one. about somebody being mean. Shit. <laughs> I'm six one, Shannon. <laughs> Five eight. That's a far cry away from six one. Your measure, your measure is off. I always see you when we're sitting down. We're always sitting down at a table talking. Six one, man. Far cry from five eight. I'm Cheyenne. I'm, I'm Cheyenne. I'm not Choctaw. <laughs> if you're Choctaw, you'd be like this. All this way. Six one wide, right? Touche, <laughs> touche. Um. Okay. I, I, and I'm not, I, I, you know, to all respect to all the Choctaw men out there, but you know, if there's if there's a good looking one out there, I just I just didn't ever find one. But anyway. <laughs> didn't you, Roy? Didn't you say that's what gets you kicked off YouTube when you say something like that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Being racist. laughs> you dad about it. They don't like you, the bully. You got to stop the bullying. <laughs> bullying Indian men. <laughs> that's right. It's really bad. <laughs> All right. Let's get back to your 6 1 ish uh, uh, basketball playing career here. <laughs> Well, I think that's actually a big, I think relating it back to my story and I know I mean, we, we could talk about other things too, but I think that actually, as far as that coach switch uh, dynamic, I think playing basketball, like also, when you could put a rubber ball in a hoop, all of a sudden that kind of changed the dynamics in this town that I grew up in. It's kind of interesting. And so I was really passionate about that. That's all I really lived and died for at that time and uh, played a lot of ball in high school and then was fortunate to go play um, two years at a junior college and get two years of school paid for and and really meet cool people. I've been able to play overseas. I've been able to go do a lot of cool things with that. And it's still actually, even today I went and shot hoops, you know, it's just like a really, um, I'm that 39 year old dude at the playground shooting hoops still, you know, but it just brings me so much like uh, comfort and it's like meditation to me, actually. It's really uh, for my own well-being. So I do that all the time, actually. I take my boys, I have two sons and we 
play 21 all the time. And it's my favorite place to be actually is playing basketball with my two sons, actually. <laughs> it's the best thing you can possibly do. <laughs> That's um, cool. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah. And I, I'm glad they let me do it still. So I love it. <laughs> I want, I'm sorry. How old are they? Uh, 14 and 11. Oh, so they're yeah. good ages. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's basketball ages right there. Yeah, very, yeah. very cool. So you, so you went into, you, did, what made you decide to go into law school? Was there something that happened in, in college before? Um, I think my older sister, um, and I come from like a, I really come from amazing siblings and amazing parents. And so like I have an older sister that, uh, she actually worked in law admissions. And so, oh, wow. yeah, so it's really fortunate and it kind of gave me exposure to that. I didn't even know Indian law was a thing. Right. Um, yeah. and where I grew up, I didn't really even view, uh, being a member of a tribe. Like I didn't even view that in like a citizenship or a sovereignty sense. Um, not until I got to be a little bit older uh, did I even, I was even aware of any of that, you know, like, and so it was kind of off. It was just like more about ethnicity, actually. It was more about race and than anything else. It wasn't about like, oh yeah, I'm a sovereign citizen. I'm a sovereign member of the Northern Cheyenne tribe, you know, like um, it wasn't on my radar necessarily, but I learned, started to learn a little bit about sovereignty and started reading books, actually read, man, Custer died for your sins. Like I may, maybe yeah. everybody read that book, you know, so <laughs> In my late teens, it kind of gave, turned on some lights for me. Um, so just getting some exposure through books, you know, books are the great equalizer, I think, is when you read some of these books, it changes your world. And so that was one of the books that changed my world, actually. God has read, uh, Blind oh, Glory, changed yeah, my world, you know. So there's a couple of these books that just really had impact on me. Um, and so about that time, actually, when I was probably a freshman in college that I and I did get good grades in high school, like, but I, when I went to college, I, uh, yeah, that's the, I should put that on my resume. I was an academic all conference uh, player <laughs> in college <laughs> uh, because I, like, I started figuring it all out. Like, oh yeah, like I like reading and I like studying and like, I just kind of like I developed a little study pat habit uh, for myself and, and then said, well, I think I could, get, I could get into law school if I wanted to get into law school. And so. Um, I did that. And luckily my sister is really good at helping with personal statements. So she edited it for me and <laughs> kind of helped me out with that. Gave me free, uh, free advice on how to get into law school. So. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, so you, I hated law school. Did you like law school? Oh, <laughs> uh, I hated it. Um. <laughs> so why do you guys do it? Nobody likes lawyers and, uh, Dun, you guys dun. hate law school and law uh, and order. Dun dun. You think you're going to be like some major litigator? I thought I I really wanted to be a litigator. That's what that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in the courtroom, and that's not at all what happened. Well, for most <laughs> lawyers, that's not what happens. Yeah, you yeah, guys no. always end up doing something different or in jail. <laughs> not or, or, or comedians on a on a stage or something like that. You know? That's yeah. right. <laughs> Actually, this is my ten year graduation anniversary, and like I'm looking at all my classmates that I went to school with. A lot of them don't practice law anymore. Like a lot of them are doing just a lot of different things, you know. So it's a tough profession, and it's a like it's a high burnout profession, and. Yeah. Um, I knew like I had a, actually I had the imposter syndrome, and so I. Like I grew up in the small town and didn't really think that was ever even possible. So even getting into law school is like a big thing for me. And I remember the very first day of law school, you go to orientation if you're one L. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time I was married, um, had one child. We moved down there on a shoestring budget and I, I didn't have money to buy the books for the first day. And um, yeah, so it was kind of a rough situation. So I already didn't feel like I belonged there and then put that on top of it. Like I show up the first day with no books. <laughs> and so, um, but to my fortune, my great fortune, this seriously happened. I was sitting outside of UNM Law School. I could show you exactly where it was, like questioning like, man, I don't think this is, I don't think I belong here. Um, these guys belong. Those two people that drove up in those BMWs, they look like they belong here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, I don't when I look at Shannon, I don't go, I don't go lawyer. I go, oh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, she made a mistake. You want to know how so did they. Up, you want to know how I drove up to law school? I, I had a motorcycle. Oh yeah, 
So I, I rode a motorcycle and parked in law school. And what was great about where at uh, University of Arizona College of Law is the motorcycle parking was right where the faculty parked, where everyone had to go through to get to law school. And so here comes, you know, this motorcycle parks. I, I pulled the helmet off and did the, you know, the, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and 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 go go into school you know with with leather on and and i mean that that was how i entered law school um so uh just just to let you know i i got a lot i was uh i survived law school by being intimidating and um uh you know befriending all the um two-spirit and lesbian people they, they really helped keep me, um, uh, make sure I was studying and um, in all the minority organizations and, and NALSA, of course. Um, but it was just the most uncomfortable place. Um, and uh, I, I, I was a good student, but I sure the hell didn't fit into that kind of a Socratic method teaching. Um, mm. it, it was just, it, it, it wasn't comfortable. So I... I did my best to just hide and get through it and just try to act as tough as I could. <laughs> yeah, you said and, Socratic. Yeah. <laughs> just keep that stoic face on. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and ride around on a motorcycle and people leave you alone. Yeah. Well, I, I think but that day though, I'll, I was, was going to say that very day though, like not, not even joking around, like uh, just as I was doubting that I was like, man, this place is not for me. Uh, this girl comes up to me, she's a 2L, and she's like, hey, uh, some Jonathan Sosi, as my friend in law school, they're like, he said that you might need some books. And I was like, yeah, I do need some books. And she gave me all her 1L books. And so I had all the books. She kept them, and she just gave them to me. And then, no joke, maybe five minutes after that, I walked through the lobby, and they're like, hey, are you Sheldon Spotted Oak? And I'm like, yeah, I am. And they're like, oh, you won the 1L scholarship. And it was a check. They would actually give you a full-on check. So they gave me like, I don't know, $2,000. So oh my God. I'm like thinking, I'm like, man, I'm getting ready to bail out of this place. I'm going to walk out the back door. I get free books and I get a $2,000 check. <laughs> so I'm out of here. See you, bye. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so great fortune. Yeah. So, um, but right yeah, on. law school is really tough. The cool part about going to UNM law school and probably same as with Arizona is there is yeah. native faculty and, and they push you and help you think outside the box. And so I had Christine Zuni Cruz. She was one of my great mentors. And mm -hmm. um, she runs the tribal law journal out of New Mexico. And so not federal Indian law, but tribal law. Um, and I got to write a paper. I, I got to publish a paper, you know, like who would have thought that I would have got to publish a paper. And so I got to publish a paper in the tribal law journal about Cheyenne constitutional law reform. Oh, and wow. Making it more proximate to our values and our culture. That's um, how I know you. I think I read that paper. I think that's where I first recognized your name. I so you're the third that. person. You're the third person that's read that paper. My mom. You. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Hey, I give, remember. give me a, send me a copy. I'll read it for you, Sheldon. <laughs> be number four. Well, so everyone number on four. here, everyone on our in our in our chat room here is going to read it, right? Everybody. Yeah, we'll get everybody in the chat to read it, and then you'll be famous at that point, brother. <laughs> <laughs> They'll republish it. That's right. asking you to write a book. That's right. Well, the major premise of it, and it's really like it's so funny. I've I've had people back in my community come and talk to me, like, and really what it is is it's it's nothing fancy. It's it really is is a regurgitation of old men sitting around dinner table. I just wrote what they I heard growing up. My uncles talk about. Uh, my dad talk about. And I just put it in a paper. And so it's really about how IRA, the Indian Reorganization Act, came in and gave us this tripartite government, you know, these separation of powers. Um, they weren't based on our values. It really undermined our culture. It really undermined our community. Um, and it affects economies. It affects children and families. Um, I don't know, every five years up there, there is a big revolt and they push the chairman out, you know, like, and so there's still political unrest. And so... Um, just like the United States of America, they had their own constitutional convention where they gleaned their values, albeit they were on white supremacy on capitalism, but um, they had that liberty to do that. Um, but Native people, for, by and large, have not been able to do our constitutional Congress, our, mm -hmm. our, our constitutional gathering, you know. Um, and we did have, we're, we're a Sundance tribe. Uh, I know you guys are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. um, we had a cultural hero, Sweet Medicine. Um, He's the one that went to Nora Wuss and 
got our two sacred covenants. You know, we have sacred arrows, which are masculine, a sacred hat, which is the feminine, you know. A lot of the feminine masculine aspects are in our sun dance, which is also called the earth renewal ceremony, you know, like so, like that whole dynamic of the highest medicine, of being able to create life, you know, coming together, and being able to create life in our lodge, you know, and so like, uh, that was our constitution, you know, it's beautiful, actually, it's so beautiful, like, it really emphasizes us being good to one another, good to other human beings, and good to the earth, you know, those are the two big things that we need to be aware of, um, don't be an asshole, and don't pollute the earth, you know, like, and so, um, to a point, you don't be an asshole to a point. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. You got to be an asshole a little bit, but not too much. <laughs> um, but we had a, we had it all there. You know, it was all there. We had uh, a code of ethics that if you a acted outside of your uh, your role, your ethical role, that you could be removed. You know, so there was there was a checks and balances within that system, and so really that paper just stands for that. Is is the Western system really did. Really has we're not, we haven't recovered. I, I would say that in 2020, uh, still we're we're still struggling with governance. We're still tr struggling with that uh, because of that disruption. Right, right, yeah. And the IRA, even though it 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 did do some good as ending the allotment period and really recognizing that tribal nations could govern themselves, um, that whole idea of forcing that Western constitutional model on tribes has been extremely detrimental. I've worked with tribes too that, you know, similar thing and, and they, they, they oppress themselves so hard um, because they've bought into this kind of Western, uh, Western idea. And, and they're still really um, protective of that real, that secretarial relationship, you know, and, and haven't fully learned how to assert their own sovereignty outside of, you know that federal patriarchy that that came with uh, the IRA. Um, it's but so Northern Cheyenne still has its IRA constitution. Yeah, it's been amended a couple of times, and so there has been some amendments to it. But uh, but it's still the the foundation of it. I think there's I I can't remember the number exactly off the top of my head. I think there's 28 references in getting assistant secretary approval, right? Um, <laughs> superintendent approval in your in our constitution, and so kind of questions what level of sovereignty are you being able to assert when you have to ask for the great white father's permission so many times, you know, so, um, and it, I don't blame like, and I, I, like we're victims actually, and we've been victims uh, for, for a long time. And so just us being able to create some space for that to happen is really what needs to happen um, as community organizers. And of course I don't live in that community and I wish I did. Um, that's something I really want to do. Um, eventually is go back home and and be part of this actually i would love to be part of this um even if it's just carrying the water i'd love to do whatever what possibly could take to to, yeah. to move this forward and so it's needed it will have generational impacts yeah um, absolutely absolutely so so you ended up um coming out of school i'd really like you to talk about uh, your work with uh, indian children and in, in, in families and i know you're excited to talk to us about that yeah. yeah, before I start asking you about yeah. your TikTok handle, so go ahead. <laughs> Do you have TikTok, Sheldon? I don't, actually. You must be looking uh, at I'm going to educate you on the, 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 right the world of TikTok and oh, Indian yeah. TikTok and native TikTok. You got to get in there, man. You, I'm telling everybody, you got to get on on native TikTok because it's taken over. It's, really? it's taken over, man. I mean, they're like, it's strong TikTok. Indian people are strong in TikTok. It's cool. It's really cool. Well, you convinced me to get on, so I, I'll, I'll probably start an account tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just be careful. Just be careful. There, there's some really uh, uh, interesting things there. Um, but if you put in a search term like Native American or um, Cheyenne and just try to let the... Uh oh, what's that? Are you playing TikTok right now, Roy? I just actually, I just turned it. I just kind of was flipping through it real quick, and, and oh, one of my at TikTok during well, your damn interview, Sheldon. We're gonna talk about the kids here. You stop it. Yeah, so stop the freaking TikTok. All right, enough of that. <laughs> well, the the short is, I got to. I was really actually, this is a great fortune of mine with with my childhood career. I mean, mm -hmm. a child welfare career. This is so fortunate for me. Is I got to work for a tribe. And so uh, that was my first job. 
And I don't know why they even hired me, actually. I didn't know, I didn't know anything from anything. This is Shannon Fields all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm over that way. <laughs> but I had a, uh, UNM has a clinic. So I, I did have a, like I went, I did clin like a clinic and uh, like where you go, to, you get to go to court and you get to represent clients and stuff like that. But I remember my very first day, like it, it's just like everybody else. I had no mentorship, you know, like I had nobody kind of teaching me the ropes and, and I got to figure it out for myself. Um, but with that, I had people that were, they were invested in my development. And so I had a lot of people around me saying, oh, man, you should be, you should think about this. And even being critical about, um, so as a guardian ad litem, I was doing a best interest uh, of the child recommend, uh, representation instead of like, expressed wishes, you know. So like most attorney client uh, representation happens because like, oh, what do you want to happen in court today? And then you tell me, and then I go to court and I represent what you what you want to do. I come up with the legal strategy. Uh, guardian ad litems, and oftentimes children are represented with the best interests of the child. Um, and of course, sometimes the people that we went to law school with, sometimes they don't know what it's like to represent uh, a family that's struggling with, with, with poverty, struggling with drug and alcohol abuse. Um, struggling with trauma and so sometimes that best interest of the child comes out very wonky um, and of course that's the history of uh, child welfare with American Indians it's it's been 200 years uh, since Congress has had some explicit impact on Indian families they passed the Indian Civilization Act in 1819 right. uh, and that was explicit it's just it's very straightforward what it does we're here to civilize Indians you know and mm -hmm. We're going to do it through churches. Mm -hmm. Of course, churches have a big impact on taking children away and and the assimilation process. Um, and of course, what like I, I there's such a history there that would take I don't know we'd have to do four more hours of the show to really get through this whole history on it. Um, but I was really fortunate to be able to learn it from a tribal perspective as opposed to working a state job or something and, and working primarily in state courts and, and learning it from that perspective which would have completely taken me a whole different direction. I, I know it would have uh, just knowing who I am. And so having these great mentors, being able to help me kind of guide me. And I always tell this story and if it, I probably somebody's on there like, man, Sheldon tells this goddamn story every time. I hear him. <laughs> but, but it really had impact to me. What changed my, the paradigm of the way that I represented children is, uh, is short, I'll make it short, is that uh, you tribal elders in the back of tribal court Grandchilds, I'm representing his grandchild, uh, and I was burned the hell out, man. I was like, I had a caseload over a hundred kids when I first started, and oh and my god, this child welfare is a, uh, it's an area that will break your heart so many times. Like, it will break your heart. Um, and so I, I'm walking around with my shoulders hunched over, with black spots around my eyes, and and I remember he took pity on me, and he's like, hey, what are you doing for lunch? And I'm like, yeah, I have some time for lunch. Uh, hearings don't start until 1.30. So I go out and have a sandwich with him. And he's like, hey, have you ever heard of siatch? Uh, and that's a ute word. Um, and I heard the word. And this is what they call social workers in this community. Uh, but it's the monster that steals children, actually. And so it's their, it's their boogeyman, the ute tribe's boogeyman. And the story is, and I'm, like I said, I'll make it short, is siatch, he's a big, tall guy. He's over 6'1". He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's a big, tall guy, and he carries a wicker basket on his shoulders, of course, where he steals children. Uh, and he sees this little boy playing by the river, jumps out of the weeds, puts the boy in the basket, and heads up to the mountains. It's a two-day journey. First night, he camps. Uh, in the middle of the night, little boy is crying. Uh, horn toad, horny toad, wiggles his head into that basket. And, and that's, a, that's a good omen for you people, actually. If you see a home, horny toad, even to this day, it's a good omen for you. Good luck charm. Um, so horny toad weighs, wiggles his head in. He says, hey, nephew, why, why are you crying? And little boy through his tears says, you know, I've been taken by Siach. I'm, I'm never going to see my family again. Never going to dance in the bear dance. Never going to hear my songs. Never going to eat my, my, my food. Never going to play with my cousins. Never going to go to my grandma's house. And horn toad cried with them. And he says, "You know, I have this idea. And if you've ever seen a horny toad, they kind of have like this yeah. pointing heads. And so, little boy reaches down in the dark and fills the horny toad. And he says, "Oh, you feel like an arrowhead." And he says, "Yeah, that's right. I want you to use me." So in the morning, Siach comes and checks on the little boy, lifts up the basket lid, and little boy rises up and throws the arrowhead in the heart of the beast. He's able to escape to get home. 
that that story was told to me at such a vulnerable time that I was like so I don't know I had so much trauma going on and just so much like secondary trauma with all these cases that right. it really changed the way that I I did representation that, that really to try to be a tool in the hand of a child to effectuate change um, and so that story we ended up kind of being my guiding light in my work with with the Ute tribe and I got to work with them for four and a half years actually uh, they trusted me that much that I got to. I don't know why they did, like I said, but I, I was fortunate enough that they got to trust me. Actually, my last job with them was I went and worked as a chief of staff, and I know you did that for a while, Shannon, and I only could do that for about a year. It was really tough work. That was yeah. tough work. Yeah, it is. That was more trauma than the other job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. But, it, but that, that story ended up being my guiding light in the way that I got to represent kids, and like I said, I, I, I there's a cultural context there, and there's an identity context there. Um, and so a lot of the work that I get to do today is about being able to engage with cultural humility and no matter who you are, you know, being able to listen to people and understand them and understand what motivates them um, and doing representation based upon that rather than, hey, I'm Sheldon Spotted, I went to law school and I, I, I know what's in your best interest, you know, like I'm going to tell the court this, you know. So, um, oh, thanks for that. That's like an old dear woman's story. <laughs> Yeah, it's medicine, actually, and that's I do refer to that story as my medicine. You know, like it was gifted to me. Um, I've asked that Floyd Wyaskett was the guy that told me, and I, I asked him if I could tell that story again, and he's like, "Oh yeah, you can." That's, so he, he gifted me that medicine, and it, it still is my medicine. I carry that with me, you know. So yeah, yeah that was that was a good story because you know, like the dear woman stories, they just scared the shit out of little kids. <laughs> <laughs> we all scared the hell out of us when they told us the story. Well, that story is supposed to scare the shit out of kids too. Right? <laughs> but it ends well. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. Not like some of those like European uh, fairy tales. They, you know, the kid just dies. But but we we need that in Indian country, and and that's so important. Uh, I mean, you hit it right on the head. And uh, I wish they would have taught us that in law school that um you know we come from difficult communities um and the work that we often get into um it kind of creates a secondary trauma that we have to deal with you know and and i bet anything um i know that 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 alcoholism and and suicide is is high um in the legal profession already um, but for those of us who choose to do it in Indian country, and we're constantly, often, on the losing side, you know, it's constant struggle, it's constant education, it, it's saying the same things over and over again, um, and, um, and, and things being twisted around you. Um, you know, so I really commend you in the, the, the work that you're doing, um, and the things that you're creating. So, you're doing some really positive work um, in Indian child welfare. Um, I know you work uh, with KC family programs that, and the Association on American Indian Affairs has a, a close partnership with them because our, our uh, previous executive director is, is Jack Trope and, and he's working there now. Um, and I know you work well with him, but you're working there and you're doing some things for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. What are you doing? <laughs> Everybody who's working with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. That's right. That's right. So I, well, to tie that back up is I don't represent, and I haven't been inside of a courtroom for over five years, um, and I'm kind of happy about that, but I get to do consulting work, and so I do a lot of work with both state courts and tribal courts. That kind of is an equal divider of my work, 50-50. Um, so the works that I get to do with tribal courts, and really I, innovative work. Um, so, of course, tribal uh, children go into uh, foster care from tribal communities. Uh, so those are non-ICWA cases that the federal law doesn't apply to tribes. Of course, they have their own laws and governed by their own laws. Um, and there's a lot of tribes that have just some very progressive uh, tribal codes. Um, and I think of some, some tribes up in Alaska, villages in Alaska, where I, I've been waiting to meet the place where they do child welfare right. And it's these communities, actually, and they, these small communities where there's reciprocity, there is ownership, there's a collective identity. Um, like your loss is my loss, you know, your child is my child, you know, like I want to make sure Roy's kids are good kids because 
his badass kids are playing with my good kids, you know, like I want to make sure they're good. Uh, That's the way it is, man. <laughs> I'm teasing. Uh, but I, but I, I get to work with all these tribal courts and, and we're, we started this program a couple of years ago. Well, an institute is what we call it. And we call it the child, uh, the tribal child welfare advocacy institute. So if you work in tribal courts and do this work, um, we hold it once a year. Um, and it's kind of like a three-day institute that we we teach advocacy skills. And it's more than just uh, the adversarial system. And it's a mismatch, actually, in child welfare, uh, ad the adversarial system. Of, I'm going against you, Shannon, and I win against you, hooray. But children and families end up losing when, <laughs> when I win against you. You know, my ego feels really great. <laughs> But the whole objective of why we're in court in the first place is, is and they end up being losers. Um, yeah. and so we're trying to teach different types of skills. Um, so not just being able to get a motion, not just argue your motion or get evidence on the record or direct or cross-examine. Cross That's some of the work that we do, uh, but also just being able to understand making a safety decision, you know? So making removals based upon safety and not based on poverty or not based upon, hey, this doesn't, I wouldn't like my kids in this environment, you know, like, um, so making culturally relevant and aware decisions when it comes to child welfare, as opposed to um, bias happens in tribal communities as well. You know, white supremacy has happened to us as well. You know, like there's factions of Christians and there's factions of traditional people and, and there's different, like sometimes they'll look down upon each other, you know, so that could happen within tribal communities just as much as it could happen here in Denver, you know. Right. Um, so I so I get to do some of that work. Um, awesome work, actually. It's so cool. Like that's one of the coolest things that I get to do. Um, the second thing, and I'll and this is my big pitch, my elevator speech here. I'm gonna give it to you guys and everybody on the on YouTube and uh, Facebook, is that we get to do ICWA courts. Um, so there's 13 maybe 14 ICWA courts throughout the whole country. And if I break this down to you really quick, and so in state foster care, uh, there's about 443,000 children in foster care in the country right now, as of today. Um, get, to play with those numbers, just so you I could, you could think about it a little bit, I have to break it down like this so I could think about it. If there's a thousand children represented uh, in the whole country, about four of those kids would be in foster care. So four out of a thousand kids, but if we broke that down to just native kids, so a thousand native kids in the United States of America, 14, almost 15 of those kids would be in foster care. So there is a disproportionality of times three uh, of native children in foster care. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a whole history behind this of why that is. Um, of course, the work of AAIA and Bert Hirsch and, and some of those great people that you've now taken their shoes over, Shannon, that help get ICWA in, into place. There's a congressional record about the history of, of this, you know. Um, and so I get to work with state court jurisdictions that have, and we're talking about 3,000 American Indian children that are in foster care among these 14 jurisdictions. Um, and we're really trying to help them develop ICWA courts to become one better, help achieve the gold standard. They call ICWA the gold standard of child welfare because, um, let me back up just one second, because when ICWA was passed um, back in 1978, child welfare was so upside down. It's so different than it is today. Um, and ICWA was the vanguard of child welfare at the time. And it still is the vanguard even to this day. And that's why we call it the gold standard of child welfare is that um, when a child was removed from their family, like this idea of oh, apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Let's do early termination of parents' rights and get this child adopted to a good white middle-class family in the suburbs, you know. So um, ICWA was the opposite of that in the sense that child, if they're removed for safety issues, the first thing you look to is for family. Um, beyond that, you want to keep them in a culturally, uh, a culturally responsive community. And we're going to do this with active efforts, you know. We're going to make sure we're, we're doing our best to make sure that we achieve these, uh, these end goals right here. Um, and so ICWA was completely the opposite of that time. But now if you look at the 50 states and their, their state codes, 48 of those 50 states have mandatory kinship finding right at the very beginning. You know, they didn't have that when ICWA was passed. Right. 
And so if ICWA does have a legacy, I think it has a few legacies, but I think the 42 year legacy of ICWA is that it stands as the vanguard, it still is the vanguard of child welfare for all children. If the, we did ICWA for all children, we'd have better outcomes for families and children in the whole United States. And, and that's one of the beautiful thing about being a native person is like 500 years of genocide that we've endured 500 years of racism and marginalization and, 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 and trauma. Uh, but we still could teach the world about love. Like we could still teach the world about environmentalism. You know, these are contributions to the world, you know, right. Cheyenne, we also killed Custer. That was our gift to the world too. So, <laughs> so it's, it's such a beautiful thing to be a native person and do this work because like, I feel like, man, we're, like man, we we gave we gave this to the world. This is our gift to the world. You know, is is ICWA, um, and it's it's a beautiful thing. And so working with these courts and it's five things that we're working on. And here's my elevator pitch. I'll make it short. Um, one, you have to have a judge, judicial leadership. You need a judge that's has the volition and the desire to address these issues in your jurisdiction. Number two, you got to collect the data. We, if you're going to become better at it, we got to get some quantitative measures and qualitative measures of, of how you're going to do better on this. Uh, number three is we want uh, training. Everybody's going to be trained on the letter of the law and the spirit of the law and, and understand that. Um, number four, and this is actually, there's some data tied to this, is tribal collaboration. So the better you work with the tribes, um, of course, ICWA, there's a dynamic here where you send notice and they're a party participant to the, to the case. Um, if a tribe is in the room at shelter hearing, and that means they, they didn't get the notice, the notice hasn't been sent to them yet, actually. But they know that ICWA court happens on Tuesdays, and they're at they're at court on Tuesdays. If they're in the room, that that child's going to be uh, have a shorter stay in foster care by almost four months. Wow. Um, and so, just being able to get tribal and state collaboration on these cases and get everybody battling for children—that's really uh, some great success on that. And then the last piece is gold standard lawyering, um, being able to be culturally competent, uh, even though that's culturally humble. I think that's a better term for it. So being able to be culturally humble. Um, and, and, and work with families and children. Um, so great success from it. Um, I could, we could say this, there has been a data report on this. We can't say having an ICWA court in your jurisdiction will reduce the amount of kids in foster care in your jurisdiction. So um, so we're out there trying to turn an ICWA court into the whole, in every country, actually. If you're interested, if you're listening to this and want to get an ICWA court, let, let's talk. I'll be your best friend. Let's go do it, man. Let's go get an ICWA court <laughs> jurisdiction. So. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. That really is. And it's a job that I, I don't have to have an alarm clock in the morning. You know, I just wake up because I, I am motivated by these things. I'm motivated about changing the structure of child welfare. Um, and there is a big move to defund the police. Uh, we need to defund foster care as well. It needs to be, it needs to look different at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, and, and what do you feel about adoption? I mean, private adoption agencies as well. And, and I know uh, we're looking into doing some research there um, because there are a lot of incentives uh, to remove Indian children before anyone knows that there's an Indian child that, that may need a home. And uh, some states uh, uh, have enough loopholes in their system where these private adoption agencies get a hold of these children and, and basically sell them to parents for $30,000, <laughs> you know, and, and so there are all these financial incentives and attorney's fees and what have you. And um, Indian children are still leaving. So, I mean, do you, uh, is most of the work in, in foster care, or are you dealing with adoption placements too? And do you see that kind of private adoption stuff happening? Um, Actually, unfortunately, I just work on the involuntary side of things, so on the foster mm -hmm. care side of, uh, of ICWA. Um, but it's interesting, like some of the states that have the, the most lax paternity laws when it comes to our, our states that are predominantly Christian, you know, South Carolina, Utah. Um, and so a lot of places, they end up becoming adoption mills. Is they'll, they'll fly people in, actually, to have their child in these states so they could, they could dodge some of these uh, voluntary adoption uh, ICWA provisions. And so it is, I don't, I don't do very much work on that side. I am aware of it, but I don't do very much work with yeah. that. Yeah. Wow. So, so what do you see yourself doing five years from now? What do you think it'll look like five years from now? Um, with this work or just me in general? Well, this work and you. 
What, what are you going to do? Are you going to come work for us anytime soon? <laughs> <laughs> this is a job offer right here. All right. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think this work, I, I really want to, I think there's some policy things that really need to happen to really impact um, foster care. But I hope this work very specifically with the courts. Mm -hmm. uh, the end goal is I, I hope one day that the Children's Bureau, you can go on their website and they say, uh, Equa Court grants, uh, and you could apply for an Equa Court grant to have an Equa Court, and it has all the bells and whistles with technical assistance providers and trainers uh, that will come and help you get this off the ground. Um, and, and there's it's there's a lot more research done around it so that we could brag about the the stats with it. I, I hope this really impacts lawyering when it comes to child welfare. Yeah. Um, and so that those lawyers look different. They're more solution oriented and those are the skills that you need. Uh, and I'll tell you, like, I wasn't a very good lawyer. I know I wasn't. Um, I know some really good lawyers and I wasn't a very good courtroom lawyer. I know I wasn't. But my great strength was actually at a courtroom. Like I could get everybody on the same page. So we say, do a judge. We just need you to sign this agreement because we got it all figured out. And here's where we're at. Um, and it's the child is going to win. I'm representing the child and, and we're going to win. So I used to always just brag around that I was undefeated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <yeah. laughs> but that was my great strength. And I, and I think more of those skills. And I just found that out by accident, actually. Um, I was fortunate and I was lucky to find that out by accident. Um, so some of those skills, um, instead of, I, and I, I know there's some argument on this is like, like, oh, there's parents' rights at stake. And yes, there is. Uh, also their motivation because child welfare is unique in the sense that we'll bring you in. I, I get brought in tomorrow on a foster care case. The whole purpose of this case up until disposition is to prove how terrible the dad I am. Um, and we're getting a lot of evidence on the record. It's going to be, I'm going to feel really bad. I'm going to feel really dejected. I think Indian parents, especially there's a additional trauma on top of that. Um, and then after we get past that, oh, like, all right, dust you off, Sheldon, let's work together. You know, like, let's let's get your kids back, you know, and like, uh, there, there's just not humanity in that. Um, there's a better way of doing that. Right. And right. I want, uh, and of course, when you go to law school, you don't learn any of these skills, by the way, you don't learn any of these skills necessarily. Um, but those are the skills needed to really create space where healing can happen. That's the only thing we can do is create space where healing can happen, because I don't expect judges or lawyers to be healers. They're the opposite of that. <laughs> it's like, but we could create some space where families could have their own volition and have their own attention. And that ceremony, you know, like we were talking about ceremony earlier, you know, like if you're going to, if you're going to do ceremony, that's the first thing you have to have is intention. You know, I, I have intentions, you know, I have an intention. I have an idea why I'm going into that lodge. You know, I have this reason that I'm going to do this. And so, um, that's what's needed in the, in the, that ceremony as well for, for right. families that have been, are dealing with intergenerational trauma and the genocide of, of, of their people. So I know I'm talking a lot. No, that, that, that's what the, well. this is for. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know a lot of people have been uh, putting out some uh, comments here. Roy, are you seeing anything that, that we need I, to. I, I am. And that's what I wanted to, I wanted to, now we have a lot of, of, of good people in the, in the chat room. We've, we've got a gentleman that uh, has been joining lately and he, he, he brings up a lot of good questions. His name's Lance and uh, not that everybody else doesn't put good questions, but he just grabbed one that we kind of touched on today. Something that I'd like to talk a little bit about because just because it's like national news right now and it's always been an issue. Um, and uh, one of those things that I think is kind of a, a, a little tipping point when it comes to the other side uh, seeing things happen. And, and I'm going to put Lance as a question up here right now says, what do you think about the NFL and their debate of the DC's team? And and I know my sister, you know, gave her – she got up on her soapbox and said, oh, they're just changing because of the money and da-da-da-da-da and all that, you know. And and she's true. She's, she's correct. She's right. She's right. Thank um, you. Thank you, Roy. But <laughs> – but <laughs> – but – I, I, I don't care how how it's come about or how it's gotten the mainstream or how it's actually being considered. It's there now. And uh, and I think that um, the time is is right to 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 make the sh to take the shot. You know, it's like, hey, it's this is this could be a win and this could be something that opens up some more cans. 
and some more whoop ass can jump out, you know? So that's, uh, that's my opinion. What do you, what do you think of the situation, Sheldon? Well, it's, it's ripe. And I, I think the black right life's movement, um, black lives matters movement is really kind of helped America at least be a little bit introspective about this. Um, and I think there's been a lot of organizing on, on black and brown side, um, to be able to address this in a, in a very direct way. It's funny because I, I just saw that like this whole rally that's happening up in the Black Hills right now, it's it's about protecting the past, you know, and even the whole motto of our of our president right now, make America great. It is this uh, coded race, uh, white supremacist uh, statement here. But America, like you like we really reflect on this. And I, I know we're all woke to this is that like I think like um, America is still in its infancy. It's still Peter Pan, you know. It's still it's still work, living in Never Neverland, you know, because they've never had to confront the harm that they've they've done. They're still an immature child, you know. They've never had to hold, be held accountable to the original sins of America, um, the genocide of Indian people, number one, and number two, slavery, you know. So those are those are the two great sins, and and they've created all these mod they've created mascots, they've created. Uh, statues they've created all these different things to really hold those things in place um, and so I think just the black lives movement uh, the work that's being done on the ground here in Denver there's protests every night actually I'm so proud of that I got to take my sons to it one day and I'll tell you man there's something so powering empowering for me as a dad to march with my boys and hear them do the fuck the police chant to the actual police, you know, like this. <laughs> right in front of them. I'm doing this bad thing somehow. I don't know. I'm just doing really good. <laughs> so, so here's a, here's another side of that. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, I live in, you know, California and, the, you know, California is always accused of being this very liberal stronghold, you know, and uh, uh, that's not where I live in Southern California. I live in, I live in the Inland Empire, which is like their last holdout of the the conservative movement the you know the, the that's white just people your family right that's with your family this whole place out here is is <laughs> like this is their last place of hope out here well they started gathering um yesterday uh in a little town out here and it's a it's this it's one of those it's a horse town there's um there's uh it's it's in here in Southern California in the cities, uh, but they they've got horse trails and so they're horse country and there's a lot of you know the uh, Merca people there, and uh, so they found this parking lot and they all started gathering, and you know all of the the Karens and and the the ball headed guys with the shirts that have SS on them and everything. I mean the real real deal guys you know were out there. And um, they were, they had their, their pickup trucks and their flags hanging off the back and they did the, they, they did the whole thing and they all started protesting. But the, the thing about it, you know, and their make America great again hats and that, and the thing about it is they, they were really ugly and uh, yeah, exactly. April, that's, that's where it was. And uh, so the, um, they were, they had them all on television and, these people like were really representing, you know, I'm talking, they really had Nazi insignias on their shirts and, and they were yelling and they were spitting mad and they were screaming at people and they were waving their flags and they were so upset and, and they were punching people and, and just looking ugly. It was, it was ugly. It was really ugly. And, and almost every time I see that happening now and it's on television, it's just so repulsive. And I think people are seeing this and they're not, uh, not that their cause deserves anything good, but they're, they're not doing their cause any good. And, and they're exposing themselves and uh, America and everybody else is getting to actually see this. And, uh, and, and I like that exposure because like you, Sheldon, I was, I was, you know, born in a, in a mixed family and I was adopted out of my Indian family, my Indian name was taken from me and all those things too, when I was younger, but I lived in both of those worlds. So in behind closed doors, I saw how white people acted when there wasn't a black, brown or red or yellow person around and how they would speak. And, you know, I fit in enough to where they would feel comfortable enough to show their reveal themselves to me. 
And I always saw that, you know, and, and it was so, it was always so ugly to me to see these people acting like that, but now they're exposed a lot more lately. And uh, I think that's a good thing. I think that's part of, you know, like, like even, even like the, the, the mascot thing that we were just talking about, you know, Shannon said, Hey, you know, I'm just, you know, she's criticizing it, of course, because it's true. It's, it should have been done a long time ago, um, but it's happening. And the same thing with, you know, these people that are exposed right now, they should have been exposed a long time ago. Um, but for generations, they've been acting like this. And now it's starting to be exposed and people are seeing who they really are. The ugliness, the anger and the fear and all of it is like coming out on, on, on video on the, on your television and you could see them now. And it's like, ah, there you are, you know, you're mm -hmm. it's, and it's ugly. And hopefully you get to see your own self on, on TV and see how ugly you really are, you know, cause it's, it's, it really is. It's pathetic and it's ugly and, and, and they're, they're afraid. They're really afraid of what's happening right now. I've been really disillusioned though too, um, you know, because there's that ugliness, but then on the, the left, on the liberal side, the side that I, I've always thought where I stood is getting freaking ugly too. Um, and I'm not sure what to do about it. I mean, how far are they going to push, um, you know, Netflix, for example, I was having this discussion with someone, uh, Netflix removed, uh, gone with the wind. And I, ab and I absolutely understand, um, why, and that there would be an outcry to do that. Um, and then I was I was interviewed by by a reporter. They were talking about Disney and Disney's depiction um, of these caricatures and like Peter Pan and, and Pocahontas and what have you of, of native people. And it's like, but I don't know that I want those things removed um, because to me, those things are still lessons and reminders. Um, they're lessons that I can teach my son to be critical um, so that this kind of stuff doesn't happen again. I mean, I think we need in place some kind of reminders. You know, if we, if we can't take a statue down, then how can we make sure that we're educated about that statue? So I, I, I would like to, to, to take a few down. I, I guess I just, I'm not sure well, where the line is. I'm why can't sure the line is for censorship and, um, well, I don't. I don't mean to step on Sheldon and jump on you yeah. over, uh, over well, step no, over Sheldon and smack you in the face with this. But well, here's here's the thing. Why can't well, ask Sheldon like, what he thinks instead? Well, of I will after I after I say my piece. Um, you know, why can't the bringing the tearing down be the lesson? Why can't that be the thing we see? The thing mm -hmm. that happens. The uh, the new story. The new story is the ripping down of it, the destruction of it, the changing of the names, the removal of the mascots. Um, the destruction of those statues, um, you know, giving land back, those kinds of things that, yeah, we can, we, the, of the past. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's use those as lessons. We had to do that. Our generations and the generations before had to go, well, this is the wrong way to act. This is the wrong movie to depict black people in. No. How about we destroyed that movie because it was wrong. And we got rid of that mascot because it was wrong. And this is the day it happened. And this is the day that that horrible NFL team changed its name, you know, and, and turn that into the story and into the narrative versus we need those things still. No, we've been holding on to those damn things for too long. I think we've been trying to give it excuses for too long. I think, I think it's time to rip them down. It's time to break them apart. And it's time to have that be the story. The days that we finally got rid of all that shit. And, and now here we are today and now things are changing and now people are, are starting to recover from all of these years of colonization. It's just my little rant. <laughs> I'm, snapping. I'm snapping, man. That's, that's, I, I agree with, I agree with what Roy's saying. Actually, he's, he's singing my song too, as I, I, I'm really impressed by Ibram X. Kennedy. I don't, have you read very much of him? No. Um, his, his books are flying off the shelf right now. Actually, you should look them up. Um, but he, he talks about this in a very binary sense. And he says, the fact that we all grew up in the United States of America, uh, we grew up with an education of white supremacy. Mm. And so these statues are all around us. Um, so we have to be anti-racist. You can't just be, I'm not racist. And exactly. Whenever, whenever you hear anybody say, I'm not racist, it's usually they're accusing them like, hey, you're being racist. 
And the response is, oh, I'm not racist. <laughs> and so there's no neutral ground in America. You're either racist. Or you're anti-racist. <laughs> or anti-racist. You're actively trying to trying to take away these things. And I and I don't think there – and I, I do agree. This is – typically I'm not this binary, but I feel like when it comes to this issue um, – there is some there is some very binary ways of, of this and red like do away with all the mascots do away with all those those art depictions you know art actually ends up changing the world and and all those artist depictions were all based on white supremacy you know and so all those things need to come down i think the other thing though that i, I was thinking about is like how do we go about teaching this and this is a question i don't know i'm, I'm acting like i'm interviewing you now but well <laughs> what do you guys think about as far as like, how does that education go? Because I hear what Roy is saying. Um, and I know fear actually is the precursor to hate. And so when people have all this fear, uh, their reaction is is through hate. Uh, and really, I know love, and I don't mean to be like hippie and dance around and hold hands, you know, but like, I, I feel like there needs to be some space created for, um, I, and I feel, I look at some people, you know, people that I love, um, I want them to learn about these issues. I want them to be anti-racist. And so I will have a lot of patience with them because I love them and I want them to learn this. You know, it means a lot to me. And so I will give them the space and and place to to learn this and put the puzzle piece, like the dots, so they could connect them to themselves. And really that's ultimately as adults, that's the way we do learn is when I like, oh, I did that myself. I put it all together and I figured it out myself, you know? And so like, I don't know how that necessarily happens right now in this polarizing climate because Mm. There's a space really where it's so in your face, you know, like you're a racist. Uh, and yes, they are. <laughs> they but, are. But then they fight and they become more racist. <laughs> <And> so like, <laughs> so how, how do we teach that? Actually, I feel like that's one of the big issues of our time right now is us as anti-racist or trying to be anti-racist. How do we how do we do that? Do you want to go, Shannon? You ready for my rant? I'll go ahead, Roy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just I just dealt with the, this issue with my mother, my own mother, you know, and uh, um, I I feel very strongly about what's happening today, and I feel very strongly uh, and confident in today's young people and what they're bringing us to right now. Um, my generation and before, I feel like I feel like we've almost kind of failed and floundered and, and, and let the people of the past do all the hard work. And then we kind of sat on what little bit of um, uh, progress they made. We didn't do anything more. And now we've left it to kind of today's generation. That's where I felt my generation a little before and a little after uh, fell, you know, in this whole, this whole battle, this whole war that's being fought with, you know, with, uh, within this country. And uh, I think that we have to do what we've always done. And that is make those stories and tell those stories. And right now is the breeding ground for those stories to happen. It's here again. You know, there's been times in, in Indian country where stories have been made and then they were told and, and for years they were told and they were lessons. And right now is time for the creation of those stories. It's happening now. It's not, it's not a story we're telling. It's not a story we're asking for. There's something happening right now. And I think Indian country has to go and create that story. And then we need to do what we've always done and tell that story after we, we, after we go and do it. And the young people, I'm, I'm begging you guys. And, I, and that's why I focus on TikTok. So I know it's a joke. We, we kind of talk about the joke. Oh, Roy watches TikTok. And there's really something going on in that thing. There's really native young native people are getting on that thing and they're speaking and they're doing it like Indians have always done it. They're telling stories, they're dancing, they're joking. Um, they're talking about real issues today, like the, you know, the flaming hot Cheetos and, and all of these things, res stuff, you know, res jokes, res talk. Um, and, and it's hilarious, but then they're serious and they're telling the story today and these kids get it. They get it. And there are kids, you know, they're Indian country's kids. And I'm proud of them because I, I really like what they're doing. They're coming together. And all different nations are uh, within Indian country are coming together on TikTok. And they're all telling their stories. And, and they're all starting to coordinate. And they're all starting to use these social medias to coordinate um, their, uh, their protests. And, 
and they're starting to utilize the technologies to do so. So they're bringing the community together and I see them utilizing these technologies to go do their protests. Like, uh, you know, Southern California AIM, which, you know, that's a whole nother story. They've split off from, from National AIM and all that uh, just recently, like within last week. And we had one of the Southern California AIM members on, uh, the director on here on the show. Um, but they've split off and, and they've been out there with the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, on a regular basis. I mean, you you look on the television here in Southern California and you watch them protest and you see AIM's flag, you know, flowing through the protest and a, and a whole group of, of Indian people, you know, walking with that flag in that protest. And it's like, you know, they're, they're using the tools, they're getting out there, the things are changing and the stories are being written right now. So um, I don't know where I was going with all that, but yeah, that's, I think we need to tell, we need to create the story and then tell the story. And right now it's time for the creation of that story. And I'm counting on our youth. I'm counting on the kids that are out there and the young people and, uh, you know, I know there are older people out there too, um, but uh, the kids got that energy. They got that energy and they're, and they're fired up. And, and I think that it's time. I think their time has come. That's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. I think art, yeah, I agree with that. Is like social media ends up creating this whole new medium for art to exist, um, even if it's just recording yourself. And I don't know TikTok, but it like, I, I know there are some funny things. Like I've, I've people have sent me videos and they're hilarious, you know. So it's it's cool to see. Uh, yeah. like there's videos. There's great fishing videos, man. Um, <laughs> people are you know noodling like these <laughs> like these like redneck women in bikinis are noodling and pulling up these huge freaking catfish. Um, or you know, there's, uh, we were watching fishing videos, me and my son, but anyway, <laughs> there, yeah, there's awesome stuff on there. Uh, there's this, uh, wonderful young man and he's braiding his hair and he's talking about what it means to have long hair and what the braid means. And he talked about being bullied, um, and how proud he is of his braids and, and that he's sharing this because he wants other young men to be proud of their braids and, and what it means. And it was just like, you know, such strength and power coming from these young people um, and, and so grateful um, that they're standing on our shoulders um, and, and, and getting, uh, getting closer to the creator than, you know, where we were able to get. I mean, that's, that's our job, right, is to, um, uh, you know, to help lay the foundation for the next generation. Uh, I like that. I like Lance is making some good comments in here, you know, it's just as far as like inclusion. And I think some of those experiences, you know, I, I think of some of my mentors, you know, my Cheyenne mentors, including my dad, you know, including my own pops. Like he's a, he, he's inclusive, you know, like he's very, like he's, I don't know. He's very free with sharing his, he loves being Cheyenne actually. He loves it so much and he wants to share it with everybody because he loves it so much. Like, this is so cool. Like you're, you're going to love this actually. Um, Come to come sweat with us. You're gonna love this. You know it's so amazing. You know, like I'll show you how Cheyennes do it. It's gonna be awesome. You know, you're gonna love it so much. And so, I, I think that's kind of part of it. As I don't think, and we also, it's interesting. I always do this like little survey before I do ICWA trainings. I mean, this little quiz. And one of the trick questions I include in there is like, who live, who's the most racially segregated people in the United States? And everybody always guesses, oh, it's Indians. But nope, it's white people actually. And I think for the most vast majority of the parts as non-natives don't really or white people don't really have very many brown or black friends actually and so they don't have people that they love that could give them diverse perspectives you know like um and and that's how i learned things you know is like i don't know I, I i love roy i love shannon you know and you're telling me your worldview and i'm like wow that's interesting i might disagree with it but i'm like i go oh i can see shannon has a different perspective of it um and I love her, so it's a, that's a good perspective, you know. Likewise, you know, like I, I feel like that's really a what needs to be happening. Discussions, right? Like we can have real conversations, and I and and it seems like we can't have that in a, a more public. It, it's just not happening. And I and you hit it right. That that was beautiful, Sheldon. That that the most segregated people are are white people. Uh, uh, that is powerful statement what you just but self self-made segregation yeah yeah right. because that's that's really how it is they've they've closed themselves off intentionally 
Force them to go to our schools. <laughs> Force them into our community. Well, well, I mean, you 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 you've got to kind of understand it because, um, you know when, you know when I go when I go back home, you know to Powell and 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 to you know, there's a culture there and and they act different, they react different, they everything is is um, unless you're part of it, it's it's a very uncomfortable place to be, and. All cultures are like that. My next door neighbor, he's uh, he's from Iran, and they come over. Um, their families come over in droves, and they have when they have parties, they have parties, and they it's it's culture, you know, uh, out here Mexican culture is that way, you know, it's culture. White people don't have culture like that, you know. They have their traditions and their ceremonies and things that they do also, but for some reason the gatherings. And, and when you try and bring them into it, they get very uncomfortable and they don't seem to, you know, understand like, Hey, you like, for me, it's easy. I just jump into the, that party next door and, and man, I'm eating their food and I'm talking to their people and we're dancing and everything's, you know, it, it, you know, I understand being involved in a, in a culture. I see other people, like I said, when, when the white folks come over, they, they have a real hard time. They stand in the corner and they, they don't get involved and they're not used to that kind of, you know, it seems like that kind of thing. A lot of them, not all of them, of course, they're not going to put them all in a basket, but I think in general, they don't understand, you know, close cult knit cultures like that. And so they, they, so by out of fear and not being able to fit in, they've segregated themselves, you know, and, and uh, I've never heard it put that way like Sheldon did, but man, that really, that really makes my, puts everything in perspective, you know, they've, they've, uh, they've literally self segregated themselves, maybe out of fear. I don't know, or just, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, they don't like the taste of, of spices and chocolate. They like vanilla. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mayonnaise, bread, that's all. <laughs> no, and I think, I don't know, to your point, and kind of cooking back to what you guys are saying is I feel like that whole like, notion of white supremacy, um, even white, everybody loses with that. Even white people do. Um, yes. And so here in America, like what truth and reconciliation looks like for us, actually there's reconciliation that white people need to go through as well, like with themselves, because they've been lied to for so, so long, you know, manifest destiny. That's a lie, you know, like, like race, uh, slavery, like the lies they've been told around that, like, like people are wearing Confederate flags for hell's sakes, you know, they've recreated this whole thing. So all this is based upon lies, you know, that they need to come to terms with as well. Yeah. Um, and of course, as us as native people, like there's a whole like, I don't know, I'm a direct descendant of Sand Creek Massacre, actually, my great grandfather, the one that gave a spotted elk, he was two years old when Sand Creek happened, you know. Um, once again, I heard those stories at my dinner table, too. Um, and my kids know those stories, you know, like, and so there, there's some severe harm that we still carry with us even to this day. In 2020, Sand Creek happened in 1864, um, and still that's that's still on the front of our minds, you know, like that we're still aware of that harm and that damage that it caused to our family. You know, he was orphaned at that. Um, we, we know that. We know the whole story. There's an oral, oral history story in our family about that, you know, so it's, it's, it's something that still sticks with us. Hmm. And there's been no truth about it, you know, like for us to have reconciliation, a public reconciliation of it. And I, I think that includes I, the other R word. It, it does include reparations, actually. I think we hmm. need to. Uh, and I, I have ideas what that looks like, too. We can start well, doing a property tax here in Denver. And, <laughs> and that's and that's good that, that that's actually being spoke of too, because that's another one of those, that's that R word that it's like, no, 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 let's, let's try and talk about the mascot issue first. Let's not, let's not get so deep. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Easy, easy. No, no, no. Go, go. These things need to be talked about and done now. The stories need to be talked about. Not, we need to do now, talk about the stories later of how we changed it. You know, not, not let's, oh no, let's not talk about that issue. Reparation. No, 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 no. You know, no, nah, it's time. It's time. It's here. And, and uh, I think that there is uh, a crack in the armor right now. And, and Indian country needs to start taking advantage of this situation and, and, um, you know, start speaking up. And I think they're going to, I think they are. I think that's what's happening. Yeah. And I think the next two days are going to be important because right now, I think this whole black lives matter thing is going to switch over to, you know, Native Lives Matter here pretty soon. 
after these next two days of where they're at and what they're doing there. I think there may be some, some, uh, there may be some fireworks at this thing. <laughs> and some fires too. <laughs> yeah. right. So well, I'd like, I don't know. I, I heard this recently. And uh, of course our president right now, he's, he's Cornell West calls him, calls him a gangster. He is man. That guy is. <laughs> Cornell West. Awesome. You look at, you look at what this dude's doing, you know, like you look what uh, what Trump's doing. He went to Tulsa, you know, right at Juneteenth. You know, he's going up to our Black Hills, you know, right now, you know, like so. Right now. There's some intentionality of what, what this dude's doing, you know, like uh, he remember he, when uh, he brought the code talkers to the White House. And who was in the background? The Andrew Jackson, old Hickory was in the background, you know. You know, but I don't think that I don't think he's smart enough to have been doing all this. I think there's some people behind the scenes that are that are coordinating all this crap. And I do agree with that. Yeah. And the thing that I I think it's that that Weasley SOB, what's his name? Uh um oh, he looks like a Nazi. He looks, I mean, he just straight up you look at him and you're like, whoa, whoa. You know who I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Um, oh, you got to know. What is his name? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. He's where? Oh, he's part of the administration. He's one of uh, one of Trump's administration. I'll, I'll remember his name. Continue talking. I'll, I'll, I'll look him up right now. Well, the <laughs> point that I was driving at is like, uh, like Trump is not necessarily the problem. Uh, he's not it. He's a symptom. He's a symptom of the sickness that we have. You know, like he's, he's the manifest symptom that we have. Of, of there he is. <laughs> Country. Oh, Stephen Miller. Hey, there you go. That's him. That's who I'm talking about. Stephen Miller. I think he, this cat and whoever's controlling that cat is behind a lot of that stuff because they're, they're, they're throwing out dog whistles. You know, it's all that stuff is dog whistles, you know, get the, he's, the, he's the architect of the reason we have children in cages right now at the border, you know, like exactly. And, and the horribleness of that. So, so, so um, I want to. I, I hate to do this, but I have a, another show at seven <laughs> that, I, that I that I can that I participate in. Uh, that's why we're changing to Sundays, which is coming when Shannon. Um, it's going to start on July nineteenth. Is going to be our first Sunday show at four p.m. Pacific and seven p.m. Eastern, and. Um, uh, but next week we'll still be on Friday on July 10th. Yep. Yes, sir. And we got a new guest. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But I, I want to wrap it up to before it gets too late. Sheldon, it's been awesome. And we're, obviously we say this, we're, we got to have you on again and, and do an update and talk about some more stuff because this is very cool. Very cool. Thank you for coming on. Uh, you got something you want to you wanna wrap up with? Anything that you wanted to say? Stuff you want to talk about that you want us to maybe link to or something? Um, do well, it. I don't have anything to sell. Damn it. I wish I did <laughs> a t-shirt Sheldon spotted out t-shirt or something. Oh, yeah. I have this cool Jim Thorpe. T-shirt. <laughs> you can find it on Amazon. Um, no, the last thing I'll just say is that like what I'm aware of right now is like, I talk about child welfare. I know that's a very nuanced area and maybe, uh, maybe some of our guests and people that are watching this don't, they might have never met anybody in, in foster care or know anything about that. Um, and they, wow, this is completely off my radar kind of thing, but I, but it is all of our responsibilities. It, it is a collective responsibility. And we've lived in this society that's told us also lies about individualism and about reciprocity that we've kind of forgotten about a lot of things. And so being a good relative is, is paramount. I guess if I had anything to sell, it would be that, um, is that I know going to law school, I had all these ambitions too, like Shannon, like I, I thought I was going to go make a lot of money and go do all this other stuff. And like, and of course, that's the wrong orientation to have it. But as I'm getting older and being becoming more aware, being a good relative, you know, being a good father, being a good brother, being a good friend, you know, like. And so, if I have any message for you guys, is is be a good relative, you know, because um, that has some transcendent impacts. You know, it has some ripple effects. Of uh, we're all going to have struggles in our lives. We're all going to have some tough days. And so, uh, having having good friends around us, that's that's what it's all about. You know, good family, good friends. Oh man, great, great last words. Thanks, Sheldon. Yeah, thank you. This is fun. Yeah, have me on again. We will. We will. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. You can stay with us. We'll we'll bring you down and 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 we'll talk to you after the show if you don't mind. Okay. Cool. All right. Right on. Well, a, another great show there, Roy. Thank you that very was, much. Sheldon was great. That was awesome. We had fun. 
Yeah. Did, did you? No, I was terrible. I had a terrible. <laughs> it was a good time. <laughs> hey, thanks, chat room. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, um, everyone was really talking a lot. I wish we could have gotten to more of your your questions, but thank you for participating and 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 talking with us. Yep. And uh, thank JD, thank Lance, and and uh, and Sandra. Thank you guys. And now we have a new we have a new admin. Sandra's now our admin. I uh, put her. You can Did you it? can ban people, kick people off of the stream if okay. we can't get to it, and they say something wrong. That so power now, watch I, out. <laughs> so anyway, and uh, thanks to Sheldon for coming on. Shannon, you got anything last to say before we we have to roll here? I just want to thank the Association on American Indian Affairs and its oh. board for, um, yay, SG, uh, uh, for producing our show, Red Hoop Talk, Native News and Talk. And next week's guest on July 10th, our last Friday episode, um, will be a, a wonderful couple, uh, some great friends of mine, uh, Shannon and Tiger Martin. Uh, Shannon is uh, from Gun Lake and Tiger is Creek. And um, uh, they're going to uh, tell us some stories and uh, we'll get to know them a little bit. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that show next week. Right on, right on. Okay, everybody, thanks again. And uh, we'll see you next Friday, Red Hoop Talk. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>